In the previous lecture, we saw sheaves and uh, defined them to be assignments of vector spaces and linear maps to the simplices and face relations of superficial complexes. In this lecture, we're going to see that these assignments, these algebraic assignments to simplices and their face relations produce new cohomology theories. So let S be a sheaf on a simplicial complex L. Um, and to define a cohomology theory, I guess we need a cochain complex. So here is what the cochain groups of the cochain complex are going to look like. Um, for each dimension k bigger than zero, the kth cochain group of L with coefficients in S, so that's a mouthful, but that's what we're defining, is the vector space, uh, which we'll write it as C, K, with uh, L, and then the coefficient, where we used to write field coefficients, we'll now write the sheaf of coefficients. Uh, this is the product over all K-dimensional simplices of their stocks. Uh, that were assigned to them by uh, the sheaf S. So uh, that's that's the definition of the cochain groups, and we'll connect them with the co-boundary operators in a minute. But what I want you to think about for a second is um, how this differs from the ordinary situation when we were defining simplicial cohomology. There, this cochain group was a direct sum uh, of uh, uh, not just a direct sum, but the the, the the vector space freely generated by all the k-dimensional simplices. So that part sort of lives on. I mean, we are looking at some sort of product over the k-dimensional simplices. But the trouble is, we're not just taking one copy of the field for every such simplex. We're taking the product of the stocks. And now what has happened is that the sheaf lets you add extra dimensions to some simplices by giving them huge stocks, and then it might crush other simplices completely by giving them zero stocks. So think of this as a sheaf-weighted combination of contributions of the different k-dimensional simplices. Uh, and what has happened, again, is that, is that we have a lot more algebraic freedom. Not every simplex is contributing the same amount to this direct product because the stocks are allowed to be different across different simplices. OK, to build a co-boundary operator, we have to play the usual game. So uh, uh, we assume that the vertices of L are ordered, so each simplex tau has a well-defined ith face uh, tau sub minus i, which is obtained by removing the ith vertex. Um, now, I, just to make notation clearer, I want to define for all pair of simplices um, a number in, in the field F. So this is going to be minus one if um, uh, tau is tau prime with the ith uh, vertex removed, uh, where i is odd, plus one if tau is the same thing but for i even, and zero otherwise. So this should be fairly familiar in the sense that um, this is exactly the coefficient. This, uh, this number is exactly the coefficient of tau in the boundary of type to tau prime, or conversely, it is exactly the coefficient of tau prime in the co-boundary of tau. So this number is not strange. I mean, this is what goes into the boundary matrices when we're computing homology or cohomology of L ordinarily. Okay. Uh, so that was just a note. Uh, and now we're ready to define the co-boundary operator. So for each dimension k bigger than zero, the kth co-boundary map uh, of L with coefficients, again, the same mouthful in the sheaf S 
is defined as follows. Uh, is defined to be the linear map. So this is going to be, um, so we, as usual with co-boundaries, uh, we index it with superscripts rather than subscripts. So there's a K at the top and then the S at the bottom indicating that it is the sheafy version, not the ordinary one with L. Um, and this is going to go from the kth cochain group that we've just defined to the k plus first cochain group with coefficients in S. Um, okay, so how should we define it? Well, each of these cochain groups, if you go back to the definition, is a product over the various simplices. So the domain is a product over the k simplices and the codomain is a product over the k plus one simplices. Um, so we can really write this enormous thing uh, as, as a matrix, as a, as a block matrix, I should say, um, where over here, so there are various blocks, and over here, there are various blocks. And what's indexing the blocks are the simplices of the appropriate dimension. So um, here you have, um, let's say, um, S of tau. So these are the k-simplices, k-simplex stocks. And here you have the k plus one simplex stocks. So let's say tau is a k-simplex and tau prime is a k plus one simplex. So this row and this column, what we have to do to define uh, this, this uh, map uh, the co-boundary map is to tell you what goes here and uh, what goes there that block is this coefficient that we had computed uh, zero or plus minus one that scalar multiple of the restriction map. now uh, that's what goes in this slot and now of course for any pair of uh, simplices tau and tau prime you have uh, this this um, star corresponding to what goes in that uh, in that column, and this defines a good, uh, perfectly good linear map from the k cochains to the k plus one cochains, which have been now infused with uh, with the sheaf data. Um, a little bit of context for this uh, for this star. I mean, um, remember we only have access to restriction maps when tau is actually a face of tau prime, and um, and this formula, therefore, the, 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 uh, that restriction map bit doesn't necessarily make sense across any pair tau tau prime. On the other hand, if it's not a face, then this will the scalar will just zero it out anyway. So even though the, the, uh, the restriction map part does not necessarily make sense, the product makes sense for any pair tau and tau prime because you just zero out the um, uh, the things that are not uh, connected by a face relation. Okay, so let's see. Take let's take some stock. We we uh, uh, of where we are. We define some cochain groups. We define some co-boundary maps. And what we want to do is build a cohomology theory. Before we can do that, we should make sure that we actually have a cochain complex on our hands. So that's sort of the main um, uh, the main result of this lecture. Uh, the sequence, starting with zero, then looking at the zero cochains with coefficients in S, uh, the one cochains with coefficients in S, and so on. And here you have the zeroth co-boundary, the first co-boundary, etc. cetera, um, is a cochain complex. And um, uh, so let's see, what, 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 I, what do I mean by is a cochain complex? I mean that any time you compose two of these co-boundary maps, uh, you get zero, and therefore the kernel of one sits inside the image of the other. Um, and the proof of this uh, statement is exactly where um, all of the, uh, the hard work that went in, all the, the constraints that went into the associativity axiom and the definition of the sheaf, uh, that is, this is where it gets really, really used in an essential way that we cannot work around. 
So, uh, so here's the proof. I mean, what we want is to show that if we take the kth boundary co-boundary map and compose it with the k minus first co-boundary map uh, uh, on any v. So, what is v? Um, so, pick any v in the k minus one cochains. So, it's some product over uh, the stocks of the sheaf S uh, over k minus one dimensional simplices in L. So if you take that, you want to show that this composite is zero uh, on any possible V that you could have chosen. So if you go back to how this uh, co-boundary map looks, um, you immediately see that uh, when you compose two of these, it's going to be a row of the kth one of the kind that we've described here, something like this, multiplying a column of the k minus first one. That's what the composite, uh, you know, you're just multiplying the matrices. So uh, this looks like the sum over all uh, k-dimensional uh, simplices of uh, tau prime, tau double prime, so that coefficient multiplied by the restriction map. And that's that's going to be the part that comes from um, the, the, the del k part. And then there's going to be a similar thing that comes from the columns of the k minus one, which was which is going to look like um, uh, tau tau prime that multiplied by f, uh, not f, the sheaf is called s, apologies, s, s of tau less than tau prime. So, okay, it took me a while, but this is what I want to say. I mean, this is going to be the dot product, the blockwise dot product of the row of the k uh, co-boundary uh, and the column of the k minus first co-boundary. Um, and and it's indexed over all the k simplices. Um, and now, if you look at when this when these two things are zero, these scalars, um, if tau prime is not a face of tau double prime, then the first thing vanishes. If tau is not a face of tau prime, the other thing vanishes. So really, if we get rid of the zero stuff, we get um, exactly tau less than tau prime less than tau double prime uh, and these are the, the non-zero entries so i'm going to collect the scalars all to the left and then look at what the matrices are on the right uh, so this is s tau prime tau double prime composed with s tau tau prime okay so here is where uh, the the good stuff happens so tau, the, the indexing is still the same, that scalars are still the same, uh, boring, boring. But this part, it doesn't matter what tau prime is. Um, this composite is going to be, by associativity, it's going to be S of tau less than tau double prime. So what happens is we are summing over all tau prime, um, but this guy doesn't care about tau primes. So, um, so tau prime has been completely eliminated. So you have just this scalar, and you can pull this out of the entire scalar. And the next thing you notice, hopefully, is that this is the coefficient of tau double prime in the simplicial co-boundary squared. So in the simplicial co-boundary um, del k minus one, del k l, which must be zero because that's, you know, that's, that's what allowed us to define simplicial cohomology in the first place. So it's some pulled out term um, some matrix multiplied by zero scalar. So this is just zero and we're done. Um, we've just shown that this strange 
block co-boundary uh, operator is an honest co-boundary operator. You actually get uh, zero when you compose two of these in a row. So great. Um, that's almost the end of the lecture. We should get to the definition that we really wanted. Um, so if we let S be a sheaf on L for every dimension K bigger than zero, the kth cohomology group of S with coefficients in L, other way around, cohomology of L with coefficients in S is defined to be the vector space quotient. Um, I'll write it like this, HK LS is the kernel of, um, let's go back up here and look at what we get. The kernel of del K contains the image of del K minus one, therefore image of del K minus one S. Okay, and that's the sheaf cohomology. That's the cohomology of L with coefficients in the sheaf. And for now, all I want to say is that if S was the constant sheaf, then this is the same as the usual simplicial cohomology. Uh, because the, the chain groups are going to all have, uh, where are the chain groups? All the way up here. So the chain groups, if you had the constant sheaf, um, they were all, they would all be one dimensional. So then this would just be uh, F to the number of K dimensional simplices. Um, and the, all of these columns, these, these blocks uh, would have width one because everything is a one dimensional stock. And so, and all of these maps would be the identities because that's what the constant sheaf assigns. So we're, we would just, um, you know, this entire um, calculation could happen with identity maps. So it would just reduce to this scalar. <clears throat> uh, fortunately, the, there are many other sheaves that are not the constant sheaf. So we actually get new information for those. So for example, if you tried this with a skyscraper sheaf, you'd get something interesting. If you tried this with a zero sheaf, you'd get something not very interesting. You just get the zero cohomology groups. But the point is, uh, now you have a recipe for constructing all sorts of interesting sheaves on a simplicial complex just by looking at the fibers of simplicial maps. And each of those sheaves is going to give you a new way of computing the cohomology of L with slightly more exotic coefficients. Um, so the question becomes, how do you interpret these cohomology groups? How do you visualize them? And the answer for H0 will be the subject of the next lecture. I'll see you there.